On this day, September 1st, 354 years ago, in 1666, a small fire began in the heart of London. It raged on for five more days, destroying four-fifths of the old town. Today on Chit Chat History, we are going to discuss two of the reactions to the Great Fire of London. One, the reaction of its citizens, and two, the reaction of its leaders. Many took what they could and fled. What we see left are the surviving artefacts from London, and what people chose to take with them. It's the age-old question, if your house was on fire, what would you grab? Samuel Pepys famously wrote about this in his diary, providing eyewitness accounts of a wealthy man living in London at the time. Luckily enough, not only did he get ample warning, but he could afford to pack most of his valuable belongings on a cart and transfer them to his second home in the country. Pepys' account also wrote of him burying his treasures in his garden to keep them safe. His items of choice? His parmesan cheese and wine. Many of the less fortunate were... less fortunate. They carried with them what they could and got out of harm's way. Many found themselves jumping into the Thames to avoid the flames or running up to the hills outside of the city. One of the most famous reactions to the fire of London is from the Lord Mayor of the city, Sir Thomas Bloodworth. When first told of the fire in its beginning, he replied that someone should simply wee on it. It wasn't until the fire started its spread down the poorer streets of London and started to threaten the major industrial hubs and even closer to the richer areas of town that it became clear that this was not your average fire. King Charles II is credited for being a great leader during this disaster. John Evelyn, a witness who wrote his accounts down in a diary, wrote how the king himself was personally invested in the firefighting efforts. He wrote, How extraordinary the vigilance and activity of the king and duke was, ever labouring in person and being present to command, order, reward and encourage workmen, by which he showed his affection to his people and gained theirs. Not only did he support the concerns and worries of his people during the blaze, he also stepped up once they had control of the fire and set about creating welfare and support options for those affected. King Charles gave a speech to the people of London, which was also printed shortly after the fire. He praised everyone's courage and provided hope in rebuilding the city and plans to prevent another fire. His Majesty, in his princely compassion and very tender care, taking into consideration the distressed condition of many of his good subjects, whom the late dreadful and dismal fire had made destitute of habitations and exposed to many exigencies and necessities for present remedy. This declaration orders markets to be set up so that people made homeless by the fire could be provided food. Those who became homeless could also store their belongings in the public places such as schools and churches, and distressed persons should be allowed to practice their trades in other towns, but he also promised that once the disaster was over, they will no longer be a burden. We don't always get great records of how leaders react to large disasters of this scale, but perhaps we should consider that history is always watching. Amazingly, only six people are reported to have died in the fire, though estimates can vary wildly. But despite the low death rate, people were still understandably traumatised. Tensions were high and people were searching for answers. They needed someone to blame. Several incident reports were made, despite the fact that the king ruled the fire as an accident. A book containing eyewitness accounts and reports has survived, giving us first-hand accounts of those investigating the fire. First, they discuss numerous eyewitness accounts of premonitions from people alluding to the fire to come, indicating it was either a popish or French plot. As you may remember from our video on the warming pan plot, tensions between Catholics and Protestants were very high in this period. Even during the blaze itself, people were searching for evidence of these plots. Reports discussing several persons being apprehended during the fire for having looked suspicious, 
carrying fireballs or flammable materials with them, all just for being Catholic. In addition to general suspicion of how the fire was spreading so rapidly, hearing explosions around the city didn't help much either. Firefighters resorted to using gunpowder to stop the fire in its tracks. Pulling down and blowing up houses proved to be working as it made gaps in the streets. But the large explosions from the gunpowder, however, made people more frightened, and many claimed that it was the French attacking. Cue even more panic. In the immediate aftermath of the fire, a poor French watchmaker called Robert Hubert confessed to starting the fire deliberately. After being accused, Hubert said, Yes, sir, I am guilty of it, and had been brought to do it by instigation of Monsieur Pedlo, but not out of any malice to the English nation, but from a desire of reward which he promised me upon my return to France. Justice was swift, and he was rapidly hanged, with little to no questions asked. In fact, they did ask him to point out the house that first caught fire, and he was correct, so clearly it must have been him. It was some time later, however, that it was realised that he couldn't have started it, as he was not even in England at the time. Most of this book is spent discussing the rising number of papists in the town and the country. They actually printed an anonymous letter to end off with, called A Warning to Papists. It reads, When I, together with the other papists, fired the city, others were employed to massacre the Protestants. But the massacre was disappointed by the fear of him who was the chief agent in this villainy, and the fire not having done all of its work, they have often endeavoured to fire the remaining part. They intend likewise to land the French upon you, and for that purpose are stored with the arms, and have so far deceived the king, and that they have the command of the most part of the army in the seaports. If you want to read more of this incredible book, Sources will be linked, as always, in the description. But as you can see from this letter, they were pretty worried about the Catholic threat. Of course, the real culprit was Thomas Farriner the Baker, who lived on Pudding Lane. He claimed to have extinguished the fire from the day before, but clearly that was not the case. An accidental fire ended up destroying London, but... That answer just didn't seem to sit well with people who insisted that there must be further explanation. A memorial was erected in the 1670s to commemorate the fire near the site of the bakery. An official inquiry into the Great Fire concluded that the hand of God, a great wind and a very dry season, caused it. But despite this reasoning, an inscription on the memorial blamed the disaster on the treachery and malice of the Popish faction. This comment was later removed in 1830. In 1986, the worshipful company of bakers finally apologised to the Lord Mayor for one of their own setting fire to the city. So the search for the culprit may finally be put to rest. So there we have some of the main documented reactions during the Great Fire of London. During a disaster, we panic. We always have. It's human nature. But it's important for a historical standing to recognise that panic, what it might reveal and how we can try to be a little more level-headed in the future. Next week we will be covering some of the developments that came out after the aftermath of this great disaster. And until then, thanks for watching and goodbye for now.